ESO Deadlands Update 32 is right around the corner, and with some monster updates to the Dragonite class, specifically the Stam DK, I wanted to get out in front of this update and give you a build that will work right now, and especially in the future later this year. Welcome back, gang. It's Deltia from DeltiasGaming.com, and today we are going to cover this Stam DK, the Butcher build, when one of my favorite melee damage dealer playstyles in the Elder Scrolls Online. The Stamina Dragonite isn't for everyone. In fact, it has many hard-hitting damage over time effects that can be quite complex for some players. However, if you apply these damage over time effects in melee range, you'll nuke down absolutely everything. You'll want to play this build if you like the dot play style, a hard-hitting melee class that is very survivable. This video is going to cover important topics like gear, skill, upcoming changes to the Dragonite, weapon decisions, so you can take this as a template and adapt it to your specific playstyle. Let's get started! Dragonite pros and cons. The pros are, it's an incredible amount of damage over time effects, which also is one of the cons of it. There's so many damage over time effects built within the class, it can be quite complex, but it has a huge upside because it has so many hard hitting dots. The Dragonite is a unique playstyle with the foundation being ultimate how you sustain and with some other things coming to make it easier for sustain and stamina Dragonite, it's nice. And it has one of the hardest hitting stationary ultimates standard of might. The cons, which we've already talked about, it's more complex due to the amount of dots, but you can simplify it, making different morph changes, different skill changes, just to set something on your bar and forget it as you learn to apply these damage over time effects. And it has less healing than other melee classes, but we have a workaround with that in the two-hander. Speaking of the workaround, let's talk about the weapon choices and why I'm going with what I'm going with, and so you can take this as a template and use it to make your own informed decision. Moreover, there are top tier builds that rock a back bar of dual wield, two handed, and yes, you guessed it, bow. Do not feel that you must play this specific stand build or others a specific way because you can do a lot of great single target and AoE damage regardless of your weapon choice. But for me, I went away from the dual wield front bar that I typically play with and started using a two hander and it increased my effectiveness dramatically and a way more fun. So here's why I did it. Number one, the Stamina Dragonite doesn't have nearly the healing, say as a Stamina Sorcerer or a Stamina Nightblade. Those two classes in particular have active and passive skills that allow them to do a ton of damage without having to remorph or put other skills on their bar for survival. It allows you to throttle down, keep the pressure on without having to cast things or swap things in and out to be more survivable. The Dragonite, take for instance the Inferno skill. You have two incredible amazing morphs off of this, Carterize for awesome self-healing or Flames of Oblivion for awesome single target damage, but you can't have both. So you take Carterize more for big time heal, but you're gonna lose out on massive single target top pressure. Moreover, the Stamina Dragonite doesn't have nearly the sustain that other classes do, say the Templar with Repentance, allowing you to have near infinite sustain if there's corpses around. And we'll get to the buffs for the DK a little bit later, and it will see some buffs regarding resource sustain, but you will lack a lot of sustain in the current game's form. But we have a solution for both those things, and that's the two-handed skill line. The two-hand has one of the best melee abilities, if not the best overall damage for survivability, and that's Carve. The morph of Cleave into Carve was changed recently and allows the stacking of three damage over time effects, but also provides a damage shield. The other morph brawler gives you more of a damage shield, but even having our main spam will give us a strong damage shield while we're in melee range is a complete game changer. And regarding the sustain, two-hander has the battle rush passive. When you kill a mob, you get 30% stamina recovery for 10 seconds. You'll be constantly killing mobs, and it seems like this passive is always up, making the two-hander a great choice on our front bar in PvE context, but experiment with it. Dual wield has some great perks and incentives as well, and that's what I choose for PvP. Regarding the back bar, you can use dual wield with Black Rose Prison Weapons and Deadly Cloak. However, I still like the bow due to the Maelstrom bow and Endless Hail combination, allowing for massive AoE and single target damage. Not to mention, I can get major expedition when I dodge roll my back bar, and it's just easier to build up ultimate at range. 
But don't take my word for it. Experiment and see what works for you. And hopefully this explanation makes sense so you can take it and apply it to different builds, especially stamina. And that's the benefit of stamina. You're not pigeonholed into one specific staff like destruction staff, making it a lot more fun to experiment and tinker with the build to find out what really fits for you. Now we talked about the pros and cons, let's talk a little bit about the changes coming to the Dragonite. And the first one up is Combustion. This is a resource sustaining passive that's gonna be changed dramatically next patch. It's gonna essentially double up the resource sustain granted from this passive, 500 to 1,000 stamina or magicka. And it's gonna add a cooldown of a half a second and basically track both of these at the same time. If you don't know combustion, when you apply burning to an enemy, you restore magic. When you apply poison to an enemy, you restore stamina. Meaning, constantly applying our poison damage over time effects is going to proc this likely, giving you a lot of resources back, especially if you're using different poisons and skills to proc this as frequently as possible. Next change up is the Battle Roar passive. So it's going to get a buff in terms of the amount of resources it provides per ultimate cost. And this is the, the what I was talking about with the Dragonite. When you use an ultimate, you're going to get a flood of resources back via this Battle Roar passive from the Earthen Heart. The big change, along with the little bit upscale in the amount of you're gonna get, is it's gonna be for the amount consumed or used. Meaning before, if you use a take flight at 115 ultimate, but you had 500 ultimate, you were only getting that 115 because that's what the ultimate cost. Now it's going to scale and use the exact amount of ultimate you actually use. So you can save up beyond a 250 cost ultimate standard of might and go all the way to 500. So when you drop it off, you're almost healed and stamina to full based on that 500 ultimate effect, making sustain a lot easier. Speaking of sustain being a lot easier, an item trait got reworked, the charge trait. Increase the potency of this up to 480, up from 220, more than double increase in this. So the charge trait will allow you to increase the chance of applying status effects like burning and poison, meaning you're gonna be more likely to proc that combustion passive more frequently every half second, allowing you to stay in the fight. You may have to sacrifice some crit or some crit damage for this, but it could be a game changer if you're looking at struggling with sustain. The world and room passive got changed to increase our damage with flame and poison attacks rather than increasing your damage done with area of effect attacks. So a little bump in damage to flame and poison. And then lastly, Inferno. This is really nice because I've talked about it already. Flames of Oblivion now is going to launch three fireballs up from two and both morphs, Carterize and Flames of Oblivion is going to grant not only spell crit, but weapon critical as well. So it's gonna be not just a dead slot on our back bar that doesn't really give us any effect for slotting it, regardless of the morph you take. This is a very strong change. So you can see really strong changes for the Dragonite in terms of sustaining a little bit more damage, making it more of a competitive PvE class. Now that we covered that, let's give you three specific gear loadouts that you can use regardless of your skill level. So we're gonna give you three different gear sets and let's start with the beginner. This is, you just start the game, you have access to a little bit of crafting or you have some gold where you can buy some stuff. We're gonna rock the easiest loadout you possibly can. That's two five pieces and weapons. The number one five piece to go with is Briarheart. This comes from the Overland Rothgar and you can also buy it from the traders for very, very cheap. What it's gonna do is when you deal crit damage, you're gonna increase your weapon damage for a big chunk for 10 seconds, but it's also gonna heal you for critically striking within that window. The heal isn't super duper strong, but it's enough to keep you in the fight, especially if you're using that carve morph, you'll put that shield up and those heals will pop your health back up pretty reliably, making this a very strong, easy and cheap five piece to go with and something I use at end game still because it just helps me survive so much. The other five piece to go with is Hunting's Rage. It's a really well balanced five piece that gives you everything you need, weapon critical, max dam and weapon damage. It's six trait, you can find it Banker Eye Reaper's Mark or the Rift, and you can also purchase it from Guild Traders if you don't have a reliable crafter, but it's a nice two five pieces to run. And then on your weapons, Agility. This is gonna give you a two piece max stamina combo that's gonna give you the most damage out the gate when you just need a reliable weapon and you haven't farmed the arena weapons yet. It's dirt cheap to find it on the traders. You can also get them doing the Dungeon Daily Finders or an Imperial City. 
but most people just have so many of them they just throw them on the traders for dirt cheap. So you can find off traits like precise, sharpen, or even charge with the new changes to make a really, really good setup straight out the gate. Now, after you got that set up, you're gonna work towards replacing that agility weapon and then put Briarheart weapons on the front and then lure towards getting a basic monster helm set up. So a couple different monster helms you can go with. One, Saline's from Saline's Web Dungeon. Very, very good for just basic proc damage. Procs are gonna be able to crit here pretty soon. So it's a good loadout if you don't have Mythics or something else fancy to work towards. Another really good one is Engine Guardian from Darkshade Caverns too. It's going to give you a flood of one of the resources, health, magic, or stamina. So it's quite useful for just a simple survivability set and it's so easy to get a hold of. So I would go with one of those two depending on what you're struggling with, lack of damage or lack of survivability. So now you have that sort of setup and you're gonna work towards a, a solo build setup. And why you're gonna work towards a solo build setup is the arena weapons are very important to get, whether it's Maelstrom, Masters, um, so on. So getting a nice specific solo loadout could be very, very good for you and Vatishram as well. So the main five piece that I go with for my solo loadout is, well, you guessed it, Briarheart because of the increased healing. This is not gonna produce the most damage possible for a solo build setup, but it's really easy to get a hold of. It's dirt cheap, plus it just heals you and does what it's supposed to do. Do a lot of damage when you need it, and it's very easy to get a hold of. I'm gonna go with a one piece Krogs, and that comes from Fungal Grotto One, and the one piece is gonna give you physical penetration. So as a medium armor user, your passives in medium armor do not give p physical penetration, like light armor gives spell penetration and physical penetration. So if you're running seven medium, which you should be running, you're not getting any physical pen. So this one piece goes a very, very long way, especially in solo context. Now I'm gonna use the other five piece, which is gonna be kind of our damage five piece. And I'm gonna give you some flexible options because probably not all of you are gonna have this. And that's Perfected Soul Zon's Torment. This is obtained in Blackwood chapter through the Trial Rock Grove. And I don't even, don't even have the perfected version. I just use the normal version. And what it's gonna do is when you kill a mob, it's gonna leave behind this blue soul that you can walk over and pick up. Think Essence Thief. You can only have one active at a time, but touching it's gonna increase your weapon critical dramatically and your crit damage by 12% for 30 seconds. If you're playing solo and doing these solos arenas, there's almost no instance where there's not mobs and corpses. This is also true in dungeons and not so much true in trials, especially with long, very long single target boss fights, but for almost everything else in the game, this set is an incredible and you're almost always picking those souls up and keeping that buff up at 100% uptime. But I get not everyone's gonna have that. So let me give you some options to flex out. Vicious Ophidian is another one from the Craghorn Trials. And this is a great option when you need massive sustain and a boost of speed. Kinraw's Wrath is another optional set from Black Drake Villa. It also has some group utility with it, but you have to be very, very cognizant of your light attack weed. And another really easy one to get a hold of, and it's kind of like the Mother of Sorrows for stamina bills, is Leviathan. This comes from Crypt of Hearts 1 or 2. You can run it on normal, and it's just going to give you a massive amount of crit rating. So I would go with those, one of those options, Vicious Ophidian, Kinross, or Leviathan, if you don't have the perfected Souls on, and pair it with Briarheart for a really good combination. And that leaves the one piece mythic and i go with pale order on this so stamina melee builds really benefit from pale order this thing in a solo instance is going to heal you like a truck and make you very very survivable it is quite a pain in the butt getting a hold of this so if you don't have a mythic what you're going to do is slot in a two-piece monster helm something that could heal you as well so Malabeth Scourge or Scourge Harvest is one that I go with if I need just specific healing. And if we already talked about Engine Guardian as well, but feel free to experiment with the Monster Helms if you don't have Pale Order. I would lean towards something with survivability. And that's exactly what I did when I got the Trifectas without Pale Order. And in the back bar, you're gonna work towards the perfected Thunderous Volley that comes from Maelstrom Arena. If you don't have access to that specific weapon, you could always throw agility on your back bar. Make sure it's infused with the weapon damage enchant. It'll make a big difference in your damage. So that's the solo setup. Let's talk about the end game setup and kind of where you're gonna go with that. So it's gonna be kind of the same format, a one piece mythic and then a couple five pieces, okay? So crags we're still gonna use. An alternative to crags if you don't like it and you're um, playing with a super coordinated group where they have almost zero resistances, I'd go with slime crawl as a one piece from Wayrest Sewers. 
So either crags or uh, slime crawl, depending on how sweaty your PvE group is. And the mythic I'm going to use is Harpooner's Kill. This comes from Blackwood. It's another pain in the butt one to get a hold of. And you'd be surprised at how much uptime you have with this. And if you have the 10 stacks it up at one time, there's nothing that will outperform it damage-wise. It just works incredibly well, especially even playing in melee. The thing to keep in mind about this is Elder Scrolls Online is moving to a crit damage cap of 125%. So if you're going to run this specific loadout and your Khajiit, which I am not, you might be close to that cap. So what you need to do is an experiment when this goes live Deadlands November of 2021. Get fully buffed up, make sure you place your barb trap, someone hits a warhorn, and check in your advanced stats what your specific crit damage is. If it's over 125, you might want to swap out Harpooner's Waiting Kilt for something like Death Dealer's Fate. But I do not play a Khajiit, and I'm still using the Shadow Mundestone, and I do not hit 125% fully buffed. But just keep aware of that change will be coming up. And then the five pieces that we're going to run. We're going to run a Berserking Warrior, obtaining Hellraw Citadel, Normal or Veteran. We're going to run that on the Jewelry and Weapon. And what that's going to do is just going to ramp up our crit Weapon Critical when we're doing Light Attacks and attacking on our front bar up to 10 stacks. This thing will absolutely wreck damage-wise. The other five piece we're going to go with is not any secret information here. It's Perfected Arms of Reliquin, probably the hardest hitting five piece out there, whether it's Stamina or Magicka. This is obtained in Cloud Rest Trial. You can do Veteran or Normal for a lesser version. Again, it's going to reward you with light and heavy attack weaving, giving you the most damage, most bang for your buck for a five piece. We already talked about alternatives, but just in case you skipped that, Kinraw's Wrath from Black Drake Villa, Togbin's Warbands, another really good one. Leviathan is also a good one. And if you don't want to run the Harpooner's Kill, you can run Vatishram weapons. So you can go with Perfected Executioner's Blades. This is going to change your weapon choice to dual wield. And it's also going to change your main spammable to Shrouded Daggers. Again, I didn't like the dual wield playstyle, nor did I like the Shrouded Dagger spam clicking. I couldn't stand it. But just be, keep in mind, it's an option if you want to use those weapons and then two five pieces, especially if you don't have a lot of the gear and you don't like the Mythics. All right, that's the gears choices. Let's get to the skills. The skills, we're gonna use two-hander and it's quite complex, but Stampede is gonna be a gap closer and it has a massive AOE damage over time effect. Don't consider this like your priority thing to keep up at all times, but it's really, really juicy. Venomous Claw is a 14 second damage over time. This is going to be your hardest hitting single damage over time effect. You do not want to recast it early if possible because the damage is going to ramp up over time. So try to let it go its full duration and then recast it. Noxious Breath is also going to be another damage over time hard hitting, but it's a conal, so it's AOE. So you need to kind of factor in, am I in an AOE situation? What should I cast first? Venomous Claw, single target, no brainer. Noxious Breath, AOE, no brainer. That leads us to Car of our main spam, which I talked a lot about. Stacking it three times, we're going to give you three bleed damage effects at stack. Plus, it's going to give you a damage shield. So if this rotation and all these dots are too complicated, just sit there and spam carve. I'm serious. It's really that good, giving you that damage shield. So if you're kind of like running, oh, what do I cast? What's next? What do I do? Just keep it simple. Maintain your carve. Throw a claw on single target or a noxious breath and then work towards adding dots as you feel comfortable. Executioner is up next. The single target main spam bolt that you should be using right around 25% or lower of the boss's health. This thing will just absolutely nuke and I've got 90,000 critical in a dungeon with this thing before. Flawless Dawnbreaker, merely slotting it, is going to increase our weapon damage, landing a killing blow on mobs. I rarely use this unless I need a little bit of flood of gas, especially in solo arenas to finish off a boss. A flexible spot here that I would flex things in and out when I don't have a healer or we're doing really hard content is Corrosive Armor. This is going to give you 100% armor penetration, but also it's going to get you, a, basically make you very unkillable for about 12 seconds. So when I don't have a healer or things are really, really going rough, I swap that into my front bar. Back bar is bow and barb trap. This is a real big priority because the crit damage it's going to give you. So try to maintain this 100% uptime, not so much for the single target dot, but for the buff. Razor Caltrops is up. This is great AoE, a snare, and applies Major Breach, but you already get Major Breach from Noxious Breath. So don't consider this a must to maintain single target, but in AoE, it's very handy. 
Flames of Oblivion is up next. Incredible single target damage over time. And take the other Morph Carterize if you struggle with survivability because that makes a huge difference. Plus, you can off-heal people in your group. So when I run three DPS and uh, no healer with a tank, I'll use Carterize and throw a little bit of off-healing. Another morph or another choice you can go with on this three key here is Frag Shield. This is from the Earth and Heart skill line, and it's going to give you major mending, which can lead really, really well into using Echoing Vigor. And then the last thing I use in this slot, number three, as a flex, is Consuming Trap. So if I'm not using Vicious Ophidian, I'm still struggling with resources, and I don't have a healer to throw me shards and orbs all the time, I'll use Consuming Trap from the Soul uh, Magic skill line. does very well. Fourth ability is Endless Hail. This is great single target and AoE damage, especially if you have the Maelstrom Arena back bar bow. Echoing Vigor is a strong heal over time, and you don't necessarily need a burst heal over time like PvP. What you'll need is a strong heal over time. This thing lasts 10 seconds, plus can heal allies. So again, you're doing Dungeons 3 DPS no healer. Putting Carterize Echoing Vigor on is a strong combination to keep your team alive. Back bar standard of might, one of the hardest hitting damage over time effects ultimates in the game, period, bar none. The downside is it's not mobile. So you really need to prioritize when you drop this thing on a stationary moment because it lasts so long and it's not mobile. So knowing the mechanics of when the best quote unquote burn phase is, is ideal to drop this thing. So let's talk about the rotation as I've gone over 25 dots on these two bars, joking, but it's quite complicated. Typically, you'll start off on your back bar, closing the distance, casting Flames of Oblivion preemptively, firing off an Endless Hail, Barb Trap, Ultimate Standard of Might, then Bar Swap. Keep in mind, Razor Cow Traps, I maintain mainly during AoE trash packs, but you can do single target, but it's not a priority. So if you forget that one or it's too complicated, leave Razor Cow Traps single target off. Consider Barb Trap, then Flames of Oblivion, then Aimless Hail, your priority in your back bar. Once you get flipped over your front bar, now you'll want to do damage over time effects from longest to shortest. So Venomous Claw, Noxious Breath, Stampede, then three global cooldowns using Carve to stack the effect. By that third use of Carve, typically you need to go back to your back bar to apply Razor Cow Chops if you use that, Endless Hail, and then you're about to cast Flames of Oblivion, Barb Trap, and swap back. Then usually the first thing I do when I go back to my front bar is make sure I maintain those three stacks on carve. So usually I swipe a carve. And if you're looking at the cooldown timers, remember that it's one second to use a global cooldown. So if you have like 1.5 seconds left on some certain ability and you click carve, you're only going to have half a second to get to that next ability. Once that's down, then I'll maintain Claw, Breath, Stampede if there's enough time, go back to my back bar, and so on. And as you can see, there's a massive amount of dots, so let's simplify this. Cast your hardest hitting single target dot first, but Noxious Breath is a more of a priority if there's two or more enemies because it does damage over time in a massive AoE. Second, Carve is your main survivability tool on your front bar, and it does a great damage over time effect. So if you literally can't think, you don't know what to do on your front bar, you're struggling with survivability, just spam Carve, seriously, just spam Carve. Switch to Executioner at 25%, but don't forget to do a Carve in between that 25% if you're taking a lot of pressure. It's better to use a Carve of once or twice to get that bubble up and then switch back to executioner then dying. Use Stampede primarily as a filler and or an AoE situations. And then again, back bar, barb trap is super important due to the buff, not necessarily the single target damage. Flames of Oblivion, if you need more single target damage and Endless Hail, great single target and AoE. I know this is quite complex, so consider swapping in and out other like low tier dots for something like Camouflage Hunter, where you can just set it on your bar, and it's a set and forget and you get a bonus or consuming trap and so on. Now, let's talk about the miscellaneous is with this build, and let's go with racial choices first. So, racial choices, Khajiit is considered right now the strongest due to the crit damage bonus. However, with the crit damage bonus cap, you may or may not want to take this. I still love Khajiit as the primary racial choice, but another one to consider that's great in both PvE and PvP is Orc. Orc's going to give you a blend of max stats, and it's also going to heal you when you do damage, being very, very strong for Stam DK and what I actually use for this build. And you're going to get increased weapon damage and be really fast when you sprint. Another really strong choice is Dunmer all around because it's going to give you max magic, stamina, weapon damage, and spell damage. So it doesn't have any recovery or doesn't heal you like an orc, but if you want to swap from magic and stamina, this is my go-to. 
For food choices, I go with Artanium's Takeaway Broth, well-rounded um, food choice with max stats and sustain. For potions, I go with the weapon damage. It's going to give you weapon damage, weapon critical, and stamina recovery. For the poisons, I go with double damage health poisons. However, you may want to swap to the charge trait with a poison and or a flame glyph on the front. We'll experiment more with that later, but stick with poisons for now. Munda stone. So you have a couple of Munda stone choices. The number one one I go with is the shadow. So if I have 60% weapon critical or higher, I go with the shadow. If I'm below that, I go with the thief. Reminder, 125% critical damage cap coming up with the next update. So fully check if you're buff and switch to the thief or something else if you're above that. Attribute points. For newer players, I'd recommend hitting um, 22,000 health inside the PvE context you're doing with. Yes, if you're very experienced, you can get away with 18k health running parse food, but typically 22k is what I go with. You want to max your Undaunted out. You want to make sure that you have all your racial passes and so forth. And usually you're at uh, 22k health if you spec fully into stamina, but you might sprinkle a little bit into health. For the champion points, I'm going to go with the four pretty much staples. Fighting Finesse, Deadly Aim, Master of Arms, and Backstabber. Keep in mind, backstabber is not always what I'm going to go with. So specifically, if I'm doing dungeons, I'm not doing very long trials fights, I swap this out for the damage over time one, which is Thaumaturge. So we do a ton of damage over time, so Thaumaturge is very, very handy to swap in instead of backstabber, especially with the changes to crit damage coming. For the fitness tree, I go with Bloody Renewal, Boundless Vitality, Expert Evasion, and Fortified. For the craft green tree, I go with Steed's Blessing, Rationer, Liquid Efficiency, and Treasure Hunter. And that wraps up the build. I know this was a very, very long one, but I spent a very long time on this build and I was very frustrated with it at first. I was going with what I used to do and I had to eat some of my own medicine and say, okay, keep it simple, stupid. That's what you tell every single other player to do. Go back to the drawing board because what you're doing is not working. And that's what I love about Elder Scrolls Online and sharing these builds. This is what worked for me, but you need to take it and make it work for you. I love the 2H bow play style, but don't feel like you have to do that. Experiment. See what works for you. There'll be a lot of changes to the DK, and I'll do a PvP version of this because it's going to be absolutely incredible next patch. So get back to playing Stam DK. It's very survivable. The resource sustain issues should be a lot better next patch. And it's just one of the most fun play styles in the game. And I probably like it over my Stam Nightblade. Don't tell the Nightblade lovers out there. Thanks for watching this video. Please comment if you learned something specific and, and down below. Also consider becoming a Patreon because it really does allow me to crank out a lot more of these videos. So thanks for watching and I appreciate you. We'll see you next time.